to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Welcome to our study of the home as God would have it. As we think today about the home, we're thinking about preparation for marriage. Too many times I think people have an attraction, maybe fall in love, and they decide to get married. And a lot of plans are made. There's planning the wedding, there's deciding on the dress, there's deciding on the cake, there's a lot of factors that go into deciding where they'll go on the honeymoon. A lot of preparation is made for the wedding. But I wonder, is the same amount of preparation really given to make the marriage a success? As always, we want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Not only will you find a lot of information concerning today's lesson in the home, but you can also find a host of other Bible study materials that will no doubt benefit in your study of the Scripture. Also, if you have a Bible question or you'd like to study the Scripture further, please contact us at the Gospel of Christ by visiting our website or the information given at the end of this lesson. You know, when you think about preparation, preparation is a part of everyday life. You've got to make preparation in anything that you do. For example, if a person's going to buy a home, a lot of preparation's got to be made into that. If you're going to buy a car, you've got to decide the kind of car you want, the color car, the size of it. You've got to look for the best price. You've got to factor in the insurance. You've got to make a lot of preparation to do that. For example, going on vacation, even something like that, you've got to make preparation for. What would it be like if, say, a family, the father came home one day and said, all right, everybody, get in the car, we're going on vacation. No plans have been made, no bags have been packed, and everybody just heads out to the car. You get in the car and you drive for a while and finally decide where you're going. You end up getting to a motel. Nobody's got clothes, you aren't prepared. What kind of chaos? Would it be if just one day you up and got in the car and decided to go on vacation? Well, nobody would do that. Friend, like a vacation, like buying a car, like buying a home, preparation is absolutely essential for marriage to work. Uh, let me give you some biblical examples of that. In Matthew 25, you've got a great example of how preparation is essential for success. The story of the ten virgins. Five had got ready ahead of time. They had their oil in their lamp. It was trimmed. It was ready. When the bridegroom came, they immediately went with him. The other five, when they saw him coming, they realized they weren't ready. They went to buy oil. The door was shut by the time they got back and they didn't get a chance to go. They missed out because of a lack of preparation. Luke chapter 14, Jesus said, Which of you does not first sit down and count the cost? Have we really counted the cost? Are you really prepared to enter into marriage? And so in today's lesson, for those who are thinking about marriage, we hope to give some biblical guidelines that will really help one's marriage to be successful in preparation for the marriage and long time effect of that on each individual. And so what's necessary to prepare for successful marriage? As we think about these essentials, the first is, and this is such an important factor today, don't just focus on beauty alone. Friend, there's so many people who are attracted in a physical sense to someone else and they're attracted to them that way and so their whole marriage may be based on that attraction, that lust. If that's what the marriage is built on, that's the preparation that's made, there's going to be a lot of problems in that. 
Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 30 says this, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. While there's no doubt that there has to be that physical attraction, friend, it should not be the major reason why you marry a person. Remember, charm, that's deceitful. Everybody can put on a good face. Beauty, it's passing. That appearance, what about 20? What about 10? What about 20? What about 30 years down the road? What about 40 years? If the marriage, marriage is just based on that physical attraction, that lustful desire, what about when that fades? What about when that's not as strong as it used to be? To really prepare for marriage, you've got to look beyond the physical attraction. You've got to see, am I compatible with this person spiritually? Do we have the same values in life? Are our goals the same? Beyond just, okay, we like each other and we're attracted to each other, and maybe there's even that sexual attraction. Besides that, what else is there that your marriage is based on? Are you marrying this person for reasons other than that? Because if, friend, listen carefully, if you're not marrying based on other principles, if you haven't thought those out, you're in for a rude awakening. And so, yes, there must be a physical attraction, but it cannot be that alone. And so the first principle, first preparation is don't just focus on beauty. Don't just focus on physical attraction alone. There's got to be more than that. Secondly, as a preparation for marriage, realize ahead of time, marriage is permanent. Once you say, I do, friend, that settles the matter. That's it. You must stay with that individual for life. I want you to hear the words of Paul in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse number 2, as he speaks about the permanency of marriage. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she's married another man. Paul makes those words, the Holy Spirit makes those words very clear. A woman, or we could put in there a man, is bound by law as long as her husband lives. Friend, let's realize that marriage is a sobering and a serious and a lifelong decision. When you decide to marry somebody, you're making a decision that will last till death. Let those words sink in. The person that you're thinking about marrying, is that the person you want to be with 20, 30, 50 years from now? Have you really said to yourself, and here's what people have got to say, if, if people are going to make marriage work, you've got to say to yourself, when we make this decision, regardless of the trials, regardless of the difficulties, regardless of whatever happens, this is for life. No if, ands, or buts. This is the decision, this is the person I'm going to spend life with no matter what comes in the situations that may arise for those people. And so it is indeed a permanent decision. When we think about preparation for marriage, let's also realize this. One has to say to themselves, divorce is not a viable option. You know, I think way too many times people find an attraction they decide, you know, we probably ought to get married. That's society. That's what we ought to do according to society. We'd probably make our families, and we might be a little happier. And so let's get married. If it doesn't work out in the back of their mind, they may think, you know, we could just get divorced later. Friend, that's not at all an option. The Bible says marriage is for life. Romans 7, verses 1 through 4. Is there a scriptural reason to divorce? Absolutely. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9, that one could divorce for fornication. But realize this, that's a violent act. Malachi 2, verse 16 said, God hates divorce because it covers one's garments with violence. 
God hates divorce. Luke 16, 18. Whoever divorces his wife commits adultery and will cause her to commit adultery. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What preparation do you need to make in your plans for a successful marriage? Say to yourself ahead of time, I'm going to marry this person. It's going to be for life. And divorce is not an option. You know, I think that's the way that in generations past, people looked at marriage. And, and I think during the hard times and the difficulty, that's what made them stick together no matter what. They didn't look at divorce as an option. It wasn't even something they would consider. And when hard times came, when people had fights, and everybody has fights occasionally, when struggles arose that were maybe hard to deal with, they didn't say, you know what, let's just go get a divorce. They realized, hey, this is not an option. They thought about it that way, and it made marriage last. Another preparation for marriage, and this is such an important one. Let's realize that as a preparation for marriage, living together is not appropriate in God's sight. It is sinful. I want to direct your attention to Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 4. The Scripture records, Marriage is honorable, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. As we think about preparation for marriage, please realize that living together to see if it'll work, to try it out, that's sinful. That's not acceptable to God. I know in today's day and age, that's what a lot of people are doing. And people will say, you know, it'll save you from divorce later. Wait a minute now. If that's your thoughts, you haven't really prepared for marriage to begin with. A friend, living together is not the option. The Bible says marriage is honorable. That's a good thing. The bed, indicative of, representing the relationship, sexual relation between husband and wife, undefiled. That's pure, that's holy, that's right. But what about two people living together before marriage? What about sexual actions before marriage? What about testing it out? That's not God's law. That's contrary to God's law. That's sinful action. And friend, you're only setting yourself up for failure. If you enter into it with that kind of attitude, there's going to be guilt. There's going to, when you realize that that's not right. When there's going to be a lot of problems that you create by living together. That's not preparation for marriage that is appropriate in God's sight. Well, what kind of preparation then is appropriate? Here's another preparation we want to give. Ask a whole lot of questions before you enter into marriage. For example, the first question you ought to ask about someone who you're looking at as a potential mate is, are they a faithful Christian? You know, I hear sometimes people say, are they a Christian? That's not what we're asking. We want to ask, are they a faithful Christian? More than in name only, more than just filling a pew, more than just wearing a title, are they a faithful Christian? Here's what we mean by that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Does the person who you are considering as a potential mate that you'll spend the entirety of your life with, does that person seek first God's kingdom? Does that person love God love His church more than they love you. Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Has that person really a hundred percent been crucified with Christ? Or are they fully committed to God and His kingdom? We're not talking about, again, just filling a pew. We're not talking about somebody who occasionally does some things that a Christian might do. We're talking about somebody who's faithful to the Lord in every way. Friend, I cannot tell you the number of times 
I've seen people marry even people out of the world or marry people who were just Christians in name only, who, who really weren't committed to the cause. And the struggles, the difficulties, and the divorce that sometimes occurs from that. And so number one, are they a faithful Christian? Secondly, will they solve the problems of life together with me according to the Bible? Will this person let the Bible be the standard for our home, our marriage, and the decisions we make? There are a couple of passages that I often think of that are so fundamental to answering the questions that arise in the home God's way. Jeremiah 37 verse 17, an evil king asked, is there any word from the Lord? And in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Paul repeated that idea by saying, What does the Scripture say? If you're going to have a successful marriage, you've got to ask yourself, Will this person let the Bible be the guide? When it comes to problems, when it comes to moral issues, when it comes to how we're going to raise children, when it comes to how we ought to live and dress and act, will they let the Bible Make the final decision no matter what. A third question then that ought to be asked is, are they headed in the right direction spiritually? And by that we mean, is this a person who's growing and striving to be more and do more as a Christian every day? Paul said in Colossians 3 verses 1 through 3, 1 through 3, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't marry somebody who's stagnant or not growing. Look for somebody who wants to grow, somebody who will exalt the Lord with you, Psalm 34, verse 3, somebody who will strive to encourage and help and motivate everybody in the family to grow as they ought to grow concerning Christianity. Fourth, ask this question. What does this person believe about values like God, the church, the Bible, salvation, and morality? Does this person have the correct view of God? Do they recognize? Does this individual recognize that Jesus built the church? There is but one church that denominationalism is contrary to God's plan and that we've got to strive to be faithful in the church? What do they believe about the Bible? Do they believe it's the final authority, that it's inspired of God, and that we cannot go against its teaching? What do they believe about salvation? Do they believe that one must be immersed for the remission of sins? Do they believe that one must repent of past lifestyle? What do they believe about those fundamental issues? What about morals? What do they believe about drinking and smoking and immorality and ungodliness and carousing and dancing and things of that nature? Friend, here's what we're trying to emphasize. If you marry somebody who has morals or beliefs that are different than what we find in Scripture, you're in for a hard, hard marriage. And here's why. If you marry somebody who has a different be belief than what the Scripture teaches about the church, you may be able to teach them. You may encourage them. But friend, they may not be encouraged. And they may actually discourage you in many ways if they have different views than you do about morals. And children come into that relationship. And you begin to teach your children one thing. And they don't teach or teach them something different. And those children are getting opposing views on morality. You're again in for a hard, hard situation concerning that. And so look for someone who holds the same biblical value that you do on fundamental issues. Then ask this question. How important is worship to the individual I'm thinking about marrying? You see, the Scripture teaches in Hebrews 10 verse 25 that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The psalmist said in Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. How important is worship to the individual you're contemplating marrying. Do they attend just on Sunday morning for worship? Do they attend occasionally for Bible class? Do they come back on Sunday night and Wednesday night? 
Friend, if they're not attending regularly now, don't lie to yourself and say, they'll do it when we get married, or maybe I can get them to do that. You might encourage them to. They might change, have a change of heart. But friend, if they're already in a habit and have a pattern established, and you believe you ought to attend every service of the Lord's church as the Scripture teaches, and they don't, they may drag you down, or it may be an uphill battle the whole way. And so be very careful about who you choose to marry. Then ask this question. How do they feel about bringing children into this marriage? Have you thought about children? Have you talked about it? Do they want to have children? What are their ideas on how we ought to raise children? How many children do you plan to have? Can you provide for them? Is there more that you need to do to prepare about raising them in a godly way? How do they feel about discipline? How do they feel about training those children? Will this individual be the godly leader to help our children be what God wants them to be? Here's an important question to ask. How does this person handle money? You know, one of the key reasons that people fight and that sometimes end up in divorce is over money. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that you've got a very frugal person and then you've got a person that is a real spender. How do you think those two people are going to get along when they get married? Well, if one's a saver and one's just a blow and go spender, how's that going to work? Well, when the check comes in and you've got bills to pay and one of the mate runs out and blows money on something, you can guarantee you're headed for a fight. And so have you talked about finances? How you're going to handle your money? Have you talked about giving as a priority with your finances concerning what you'll give and what your finances are? Another question that ought to be asked about the individual you're contemplating marrying is, does this person have a temper? Friend, sometimes we see glimpses of something, maybe while we're dating or in the preparation stage, and we say, you know, that was just really a freak thing. That's not going to happen. Those glimpses cannot be overlooked, and especially as it relates to one's temper. If you see somebody who has a temper, if you see them blow up, and they're doing that now while they're on guard, while they have their guard up, what about after they get married and they let their guard down? I can assure you that temper is only going to get worse. If someone has a temper problem, an anger problem, they can't control that. What about after the honeymoon? What about after the newness wears off? What about when they get angry at you? Will they take it out on you? Very likely the case. And so if somebody has a, a temper problem now, don't say, I can correct that, he'll do better, it'll work out. You've got to solve those issues or make another decision to better yourself in that area, which may even include not marrying that person. But friend, in so doing, you'll save yourself a whole lot of heartache. Another question to be asked is, does this individual have a good work ethic? Is he a hard worker? Is he lazy? If somebody is lazy now, how do you expect that individual to fulfill their role, whether it be provider, whether it be keeper of the home? Laziness causes a lot of problems in the home. You've got one individual who works very hard and one that's lazy, whether that be the husband or the wife. You've got people going in opposite directions. And in marriage, you've got to be going down the same direction, going down the same path. And so will this person really be a good provider? Will, if it's the wife, will she be a good keeper of the home? Don't enter into a relationship with somebody who's lazy because that's going to create more problems in the marriage. And then we give this final preparation. Friend, realize the huge responsibility that is required of both parties in the marriage. Marriage is a serious responsibility. Genesis 2 verse 18, the Lord God saw of all His creation that none of it was suffice for Adam. And so he made a helper for him, comparable to him. And he saw Eve and he said it was good. Marriage is designed, we're designed to help one another. Ultimately, in many ways, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, we help one another, but we all sort of help one another get to heaven. 
Men, we encourage you in this area. Ask yourself, will the person I'm thinking about marrying, will this woman make a good helper? Will she be submissive to me and the Lord? Will she strive every day to help me and as we bring children into the relationship to get to heaven? And women, we ask you this question. The man that you're contemplating marrying, will he be a good leader in our home? Spiritually, will he encourage me in the spiritual direction I need to go? Will he be a good encouragement to the children spiritually to help them grow in the Lord? Will he be a good leader as it relates to providing for the home and taking care of us and protecting us? Are those things that he'll do? Will the individual you're thinking about marrying, will they really keep their end of the bargain? And so as we think about marriage and as we think about the home, Friend, marriage is a wonderful, listen carefully, marriage done right, followed according to the teaching of God, is a wonderful, wonderful plan that God set forth is a wonderful relationship. Two people striving to get to heaven, to help one another and help their children get there is one of the greatest blessings God has given. But just as well, people who don't prepare and just up and decide to get married without any forethought can be one of the greatest heartaches, one of the greatest struggles in this life. Can preparation be made after marriage to make it work? Yes, but it is indeed an uphill battle. And so we want to encourage you today to think seriously before you get married. Ask the questions that we've set forth today. Look at these preparations that we've given and, and don't just prepare for the wedding. Don't just say, what color dress? What's the cake going to look like? What, who are the bridesmaids going to be? Friend, all of that's fickle compared to the preparation that needs to go into marriage. Are you really ready to marry this individual? And ultimately, will this, here's the main question, will this person help me and will I help them get to heaven? Friend, our hope and prayer today is that each individual, each individual will look at these guidelines, put them to use, and really strive to have a godly marriage that will uplift one another and help you get to heaven. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.